come up camp. And last time I was here, I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, it was really nice to come yesterday and also to to hear what was going on here at Crane and to be part of Sue's um, afternoon session. Um, so this uh, chapter that you've been given, what I thought I would do is just really flesh it out for people and then to see um, how we could use that framework because Nancy Fraser has been writing since 1989 and uh, she is still prolific and she's still completely changing her view of things um, although she's, she keeps building on her work. So um, in 1989 she wrote a book called Unruly Practices and at the time she was engaging with people like Foucault um, and for me in social work, she, she sort of wrote the most interesting text I've ever read in social work. It was a text on how um, women who are poor, when they go, when they <clears throat> desperate, they, they go to a social worker and their needs, their economic needs are reinterpreted as um, being unfit mothers as therapeutic needs. So she called this the juridical, administrative, therapeutic sort of <coughs> me uh, mechanism. So, and she said, you know, what happens with workers when they have needs, you know, they, they, their children and their families are not scrutinized. Their needs are, are seen as legitimate. So these are ideas <coughs> that she sort of worked through the years and actually now, she, and and she, she wrote a lot about gender justice, about how you could make equitable situations in society in terms of acknowledging unwaged labor such as caring work that women do. And um, yeah, so I have been following her um, since 1989. I, I, I was a big fan of her and she actually came to UWC in about 1992 and I was sort of riveted by what this woman had to say. And then she's been back. Um, here you will see, uh, why is it not moving? Yeah, some pictures of her when she, she came back. She was at Steers a couple of years ago. And uh, she spent about three months there. She was also um, part of a Sandy Liebenberg at, at uh, Stellenbosch University, involved her in a um, constitutional law conference. And uh, she allowed me to do an interview with her at the time, when, when she was here. So it was a bit um, scary for me because I had to now reread all her work to do this interview with her. But I mean, it was, um, it was worthwhile for me to do that. And that interview was published in a social work journal. So um, at the end of the session, I'll just show you sort of <clears throat> writings on Fraser. We are also doing a book at the moment. Um, I can't even remember the title of it, but it's using Nancy Fraser's work in higher education. And unfortunately, it was all the chapters were ready in June. I shouldn't be saying this, but I'm still waiting for Nancy to be <laughs> writing the forward. And she keeps sort of saying, just, you know, another month. And then I, so, yeah, with that book will be coming out. But, um, you know, if people do want access to, there are two quite interesting sort of overviews, one written by Dorothy Holsher and myself, which is looking at all of her work from beginning to end and um, for higher education. And then the last chapter is looking at things like decolonization and ecology, which she's now latterly brought into her work. So I'm not going to concentrate a lot on what she's doing now. But I would encourage you if you can, uh, Mandy doesn't like her voice at all, if you can, <laughs> if she's got a particular style of presenting, but um, she did a very good lecture at the New School um, in New York, where um, 
Achille Mbembe, Nancy Fraser, and um, a free, another French philosopher, I'll think of his name now, um, gave these one and a half hour lectures. And I think, you know, if you want to hear what she's currently doing, that's a very good way of um, sort of understanding what she's now writing about the crisis of capitalism. And capitalism for her isn't just economic. It's a far more broad and expanded view. So I will go a little bit now at the end into what she's doing. But really what I'm going to do is to unpack the chapter. And for us to think about that. And then after tea I think we're going to be looking at some excerpts from, um, from interviews which were done on uh, people in high education. This thing, I, I think I've got, we did interviews on socially just pedagogies. And um, Jerry Murray uh, edited this book. It's just come out called Race in Education. I'll pass it around. And uh, the first chapter is by Michalina Sembilas and myself. And it's actually, I think, using Fraser's framework to, to look at those interviews. But I'm going to, you know, we're going to be looking at excerpts from those interviews and seeing, you know, how useful her framework is for us. So please do feel free along the way to interject. I know that there are apparently about four people in the room who are using Nancy Fraser in their work. So I mean, if you, you might have, you know, greater insights or interjections. And if there's anything that you don't understand, please you know, feel free to stop me at any point. So, um, Nancy Fraser has a very particular view of social justice. She sees it as requiring social arrangements which make it possible for all to participate on an equal footing in social life. And she calls this participatory parity. So it's not, you know, whether you don't have resources or whether you are misrecognized, it's whether you are able to participate on an equal level with others. And that would be in higher education as well, and that would be also between higher education institutions. So the norm of participatory parity applies broadly across all major arenas of social interaction, including the family and personal life, employment and market relations, in education, higher education, formal and informal politics and voluntary associations in civil society. So you can, for example, be excluded in one arena be, but be fine in another, which we'll go on to later. So I did uh, tell you a little bit about how her, uh, her views of social justice have changed over the years. So the first interesting thing that Nancy wrote about was what she called the politics of needs interpretation. So for her, needs are not objective things which are in the environment. They are subject to interpretation and it depends on who's interpreting those needs. So if um, the market is interpreting those needs, as is happening now in higher education, you would get a very different view of needs than, say, social movements' interpretation of needs. <clears throat> so she, she's famous, and many people quote Fraser. In fact, Joan Tronto told me that Fraser is the number one quoted person in the, in the world, apparently, which I'm quite... And Joan herself, I, I think, is number nine. She heard this at an American... Um, political science conference. Um, she's also, she also wrote a very interesting paper with Linda Gordon on dependency. She did a genealogy of dependency and she showed how um, African American women are castigated for being dependent and how the whole notion, people are afraid of this notion of dependency and you know, there's this um, eulogization of being independent. And this is why, um, you know, we have, why there are such issues in, in sort of, you get the denial of dependency 
and people who are doing caring work, you know, are not acknowledged. Because in society, you know, we need those people. And we are all dependent as part in, part in, in our lives. But there isn't this acknowledgement in society and there aren't the social arrangements to deal with this. And then she also spoke a lot about gender justice. As I told you, she had various models, the caregiver parity model. She went through a whole number of models for gender justice. But, um, you know, she has always viewed social justice from the perspective of participatory parity, how we're able to participate as equals. But, and she originally saw it as two-dimensional. She, she looked at recognition, which is the politics of identity, and redistribution, which is a sort of class and economic classic Marxist view, which she called a two-dimensional view of social justice. And then more latterly, from about 2008 onward, she, she included representation as another dimension which she now calls the three-dimensional view of social justice. And she also calls this view the post-Westphalian democratic just justice. Now, Westphalian means um, territories, you know, um, countries that were made, were boundaried into territories. And I was just reading actually this morning that Schillenbebe gave the, the Ruth first lecture last week, and he was saying that we're going to be in trouble if we do, if we continue to have boundaries in Africa. You know, we the, they were all sort of made by colonialism, and um, you know this xenophobia and um, you know treating people as less than across countries is very problematic. Um, yeah, so she sees that all three dimensions are mutually entwined and also reciproc reciprocally influence and reinforce each other, but none are reducible to the other. And people like Judith Butler have, have had um, sort of differences of opinion with Nancy Fraser. And she has a book called Adding Insult to Injury. Nancy Fraser answers her critics. So she's got people from the Human Capabilities Approach, Ingrid Rabanz and Judith Butler and others who are who sort of argue against her and then she has a response to these people. It's quite an interesting book. But she just says, um, you know, some people say, well, you shouldn't separate these things out. But she says, analytically, you know, it's quite useful to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so... Efforts to work towards social justice involve all three of these dimensions. And she uses the slogan, no redistribution or recognition without representation. All three conditions are necessary for participatory parity, but none alone, and none alone is sufficient. And then I will, at the end, just briefly talk about her latest expanded view of socialism, because she still believes in socialism. She thinks it must be rehabilitated. Um, where she talks about the exploitation of wage labor, unwage care labor, which is across continents, and the wealth appropri expropriated from racialized populations, by which she means colonialism, and also the exploitation of non-human nature. So it's, it's the ecological debates. Any interjections at this point? No. Bella? No, it, I, when I started reading Nancy Fraser, she was still discussing uh, recognition and discussion together. And she was arguing that, like you said, you can't use them interchangeably. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we need to see them separately, but um, because one is the result of the effect of the other. So that's 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 the position I started. 
those chapters then might be quite useful for you because they sort of deal quite a lot with misframing which Chris, Chrissy and I wrote about. There are two forms of misrepresentation but we'll go into it now and I mean if you're looking at students voice and um, whether students have a say or anything like that it has to do with representation. You know there are various um, things that are useful in that representation because it's the political dimension. Um, so why did she change from this two to three dimensional view? She, she argues that globalization has actually changed the way we now see social justice. We used to see it in terms of territorial states, you know, national states like South Africa. And this included socioeconomic redistribution and cultural or recognition claims, but we can no longer take that territorial state for granted. She says that the market is actually dictating now to states. They are the ones who have the upper hand. They are calling the shots. Um, and yeah, our lives are controlled by transnational corporations, international currency. I mean, look at what happened to South Africa, you know, because of neoliberalism. As well as these huge international NGOs and global mass media and the internet. Um, so, we need to incorporate this into our frame. Um, so, another way of talking about these different dimensions, the redistribution and maldistribution is the economic dimension. Recognition and misrecognition, the cultural. And um, she accused feminism actually of only focusing on the cultural. And she said feminism was bought over by neoliberalism. She, yeah, so if anyone's interested in that article of hers, some people were quite angry about that. Um, I, I can give it to you. And then representation and misrepresentation is the political domain. And each of these perspectives, each of these dimensions can be seen from the following, the, the affirmative or the transformative. And she looks at the what, the who, and the how of justice. So affirmative strategies for redressing justice aim to correct the inequitable outcomes of social arrangements without actually disturbing the underlying social structures that generate them. So they're not going, you know, they're going so far but not sort of radical change. Transformative strategies, they do correct these unjust outcomes by restructuring the underlying generative framework. So, um, so whereas affirm affirmation targets in-state outcomes, transformation addresses root causes. And, um, you know, I, I actually used, um, I looked at aff affirmative and transformative um, strategies when in, I had a project long ago on e-technologies or I can't remember what it was called, but we, we interviewed a number of lecturers about what they were doing to try and transform teaching through using technologies. So an example I gave of affirmation was somebody at uh, an HDI who, who actually brought his own equipment to the class because there wasn't anything else. So, or, or he bought things and you know, he may do in that way. So he was transforming things, um, but he wasn't sort of challenging the system. Another example I gave was when um, people said, I demand that you make internet available in this classroom, you know, for, for everyone, because I cannot teach. So, so um, <coughs> the internet was made freely available to all the students. There. So that's just an example of you know, the, the difference between affirmative and transformative. Um, 
It's more getting systems as a as a whole to change. <coughs> any any comments about that or any thoughts? Any <coughs> unclarity about that? Yes, Sue. Um, I, I think one of the Dylan and I have been talking about the distinction to the first and class forms are about. And one of the things that I think we put up against is that to genuinely do the transformative stuff, you've got to have a fair degree of, we talk it in, in, in the partial, so we bring it down to that level. You've got to have a fair, a fair degree of power, authority, agency, and, and I wonder if it's not that a lot of academics feel that they can only do the affirmative stuff, especially more junior academics. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it's huge. I mean, uh, you know, she she keeps talking about social arrangements. So for her, social justice is not an individual act. It is social arrangements. It's it's what, um, as Chrissy and I were looking at, it's it's looking at things like um, how things are financed, how the higher education system is financed. So um, individual acts, you know, are not really what affirmation or trust. Maybe social movements are. Like she talks about the Zapatistas mm -hmm. being a really interesting social movement because they are making such changes and they're quite powerful in their society. And they also, she's also critical of, um, and this might be an unpopular view. She's critical of decolonization and, and just a focus on that particular area, say an African knowledge, because she said that can also be parochial and um, sort of cultures are not or were never sort of in little boxes anyhow, we have influenced each other. So the Zapatistas are, are interesting because they, they are sort of have a foot in both sort of epistemologies and ontologies, if you like, yeah. Yes, ma'am? What is that particular? They are movement in Mexico, a social movement, who've done a lot of um, work on ecology, and um, they've, they've led sort of marches. Yeah, so, yes, Chrissy? I'm just thinking about the um, decolonization and going back to Crane's yeah. Is the one who suddenly I had to leave. Um, but he presented four views. Now, not all of those views would result in the parochialism that yeah. Fraser is citing. If my understanding is correct, admittedly yeah. I had to leave. Um, because what he was arguing, for example, was that we went back to Linnaeus and the classification of the world, the yeah. classification of the yeah. world, which is one dominant view. Yeah. And there are others, but that would actually, if you if you acknowledged other yeah. classifications, you would expand. Yeah. You wouldn't eliminate. Exactly. So she would agree with that because it's it's using interesting ways of re re looking sort of Western knowledge. So the whole sort of ecology movement, the Anna Tsing's work on the art of living on a damaged planet, where they look at such classification systems. And also even Bradotti's work, Ashil Mbembe, all these people are making interesting sort of uh, connections and looking more radically at, at space, time, in, you know, in, in other ways. So, I mean, some indigenous peoples are, are sort of slightly angry because they said, well, look, we've been thinking this all the time. You're coming to this party rather late. But I, but I think that, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to get this cross-pollination of ideas. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go through each one of these things in more depth. The, each one of that, the dimensions. So people from a redistributive 
um, point of view. People can be prevented from participating as equals by economic structures, which provide obstacles in terms of denying them the resources that they need to, to participate with. This includes economic structures that institutionalize deprivation, being denied an adequate material standard of living, exploitation, having the fruits of one's labor appropriated for the benefit of others, um, economic marginalization being confined to undesirable or poorly paid work or being denied access to income generating labor altogether, very, very you know, prominent for us, and gross disparities in wealth, income, <coughs> labor, and leisure time. I mean, even if I look at UWC students and compare them to uh, students at other historically advantaged institutions, you know, the, their, their, their um, ability, their, their leisure time, for example, is, is completely different. Or maybe if you compare, you know, students in terms of their gender or whatever. You know, most UWC students are working, they have to work. And also people are looking after their siblings, etc., etc. So all these things are part of this. Um, so it's not only money, it's time, it's, it's, it's you know, not having access to resources. The collective subjects of injustice are classes or class-like collectivities, which are defined economically in relation to the market or the means of production. And the problem here is class structure or the economic dimension of society, issues of education, health care, food, housing, water, electricity. So um, I just thought that for each one of these dimensions we could maybe have a discussion at the tables just to hear what you think South African issues of redistribution are um, which impact on people, on how people can participate as equals at this present moment. So could we just break and have a, a discussion at the tables? It's the last, it's this question here. She wants to ask you 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 to ask you